Hi, hello everybody. Why don't we get started? We're a few minutes behind schedule, so we like to start on time as much as we can. Welcome to our synergy session dealing with the entrepreneurial ecosystem of Israel. Mike Clare, I'm the Associate Director for Public Policy at the Harris Center, and as usual, I'm here today. I'm in the Faculty of Business Administration boardroom on the campus, the St. John's campus of Memorial, as well as those who are watching on the web. Welcome, everybody. Newfoundland and Labrador is on the cusp of major changes in its economy. Of one or maybe two generations, we've gone from an economy based on subsistence fishery with some mining and forestry to one based on non-renewable natural resources, petroleum and minerals, which are heavily capital intensive, and also a more capital intensive fishery. So where is this trend going to lead? What will the economy of the future look like in this province? Are we going to end up with a few thousand workers in the oil and gas and mining sectors, a few other thousands in the fishery sector? Uh, what will the rest of us be doing? We'll still need teachers, we'll still need healthcare professionals, etc. But how are we going to be getting, gaining export revenues? As we envision the economy of 50 years hence, what kind of work will people be doing? How will we be earning export revenues other than through our natural resources, some of which the non-renewables are going to be depleted at some point? What can we invent today in this province that will create new types of employment in 50 years? Crucial questions we should be asking ourselves today. Unless we address them, we will continue to be subject to external forces to drive our economy. Today, we're looking at Israel. Why? Because Israel stands out in the global economy, along with places like Singapore, Boston, and Silicon Valley, as a place where human creativity is leading to innovative commercial activity. That is indeed our challenge here in this province. So, what can we learn from Israel? I'm going to introduce our guest speaker in a second, but before I do, uh, let me take the microphone, let me circulate the mic microphone around the room to let our viewers on the web know who's here. But I'll also start by letting us know who the people on the web are. Okay, we, we, we are expecting a couple of people on the web, uh, which is why I'm using the microphone, and I'll ask, be asking you to use the microphone as well uh, in, in introducing yourself and also in the Q&A session later on. So let's start with Tom Beckett, the most popular man in Newfoundland Labrador. That's because I put on beer events and wine events and run a cheese club. Uh, Tom Beckett, Beckett on Wine, and a local activist. Yeah, retired public servant. Uh, Carrie Neal, master student here at Memorial. Chris Bernard Coffee, I'm a lawyer. Tony Fan for economics. My name is Burn Maiti, I'm a PhD student in Art Sciences. Uh, Shirley Tang. I'm from uh, Deakin University, Australia. Now I'm visiting, you know, Professor Fang. I'm Apayami Jonti. I'm an interdisciplinary PhD candidate. Carlos Bassan, Faculty of Engineering and Chair in Entrepreneurship. Ryan Murphy, PhD student here in the Faculty of Business Management. And just to put a plug in, I'll be giving a talk in a couple of weeks on innovation as well. Hi, Gary Din, St. John's. I'm a consultant in uh, innovation and commercialization of research outcomes. Uh, Greg's, Greg Stamp. I'm with the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency in the policy branch. On on Nalcor Energy. Sharon Butchkovsky, retired teacher. Erin Keogh, Rural Delivery of Services. Uh, Kim Bell. A scientist uh, with interest in uh, intellectual property and human rights. Jennifer Whitfield, Presbyterian Church in Canada, and a local activist. I'm also joined by my colleague uh, John Duff on the uh, webcast and Jennifer McVeigh, who's helped us organize this event. Um, so they're joining us as well. Uh, so I'll quickly go over the outline for today's event. Our speaker will speak for about 40 or 45 minutes, and then we're going to go into a Q&A session. Uh, and as I said, I'll, I'll moderate the Q&A session. I'll bring this microphone over to you so that the people on the web can hear our comments. 
Um, if you are watching on the web, uh, there's a text box on your screen. Just type your question or comment, and John will read it out for us. We record the presentation part of this session, but not the Q&A part, because some people want to say things that they may not want recorded. So we don't, uh, we don't uh, archive that, but we will archive the presentation. And also, the presentation will be available. Uh, we will send it to you uh, in a day or so. So you don't need to take copious notes. You'll have a copy of the presentation. So thank you, Paul, for allowing us to do that. Um, we're going to finish at 1.30 Newfoundland time because we know that you guys have other lives to do, and so we won't take up any more of your time than that. It's a pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Paul Preston is the Director of Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy at the Conference Board of Canada, Canada's largest not-for-profit think tank with almost 250 employees. Paul's practice issues a host of research studies for the private sector, governments, and academia and coordinates several research centers and executive councils. This is in the area of innovation and commercialization, building an innovation ecosystem, strategic innovation procurement, ICT adoption, information technology management, health innovation, and knowledge management. And uh, he's based there in St. John's, so we're really fortunate to have him here. Prior to joining the conference board, Paul worked in commercial finance at Scotiabank in Ottawa and was the Director of Business Development with the Plato Group, an IT consulting and security software company uh, based in St. John's, where he helped develop international partnerships in the U.S. and South America and led the business development team. He is regularly asked to speak at conferences and events and has been called as a witness to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Industry, Science and Technology. He's, he has held steering committee positions on a number of professional associations and is currently active as well as, as me, on the Federal Provincial Committee on the St. John's Board of Trade, among other community initiatives. So, Paul, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Memorial and uh, to turn the podium over to you. I need to get him a shorter bio uh, first thing. I think the most important thing is I did my MBA here in the Faculty of Business, so I'm an MBA grad. Uh, I'm amazed that you could get in because I don't think I was ever allowed in this room when I was going to school here. So, uh, if, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Uh, as Mike mentioned, I'm originally a Newfoundlander. I did move away for a number of years. My wife and I decided to move back. Um, my team and my role is still based in Ottawa, so I do a, a bit of travel, as you might expect. Our, our role at the conference board tends to be pan-Canadian. Our mandate as an organization is to help make a better Canada, both economically uh, and as well as socially. So we're, we're a not-for-profit, nonpartisan, independent, evidence-based think tank. Um, our, you know, we're supposed to, uh, to try to get the word out across the country. You may not know the conference board as well as some other think tanks. Uh, part of that is because we try not to be sensational. It's about the evidence and what the evidence says. We, we try to be very credible, um, but because we're sort of the not-for-profit, uh, independent, because of that status, we have, an, I guess, a particular ability to bring together multi-stakeholder groups around the same table. And that's really what led to us to go to Israel. We have a group of innovation leaders from across Canada coast to coast. They're on our Innovation Council. We've brought that group to MIT, Cambridge. We've been to Palo Alto, um, Silicon Valley, the re that region. We've been to 3M in Minneapolis. Um, so they tend to travel around and, and kind of experience different innovation ecosystems. But the goal is what can we learn and apply in Canada to do innovation better in Canada. So that was the genesis for us to go to, to Israel, was uh, really just to go to another ecosystem that's been getting a lot of attention. Uh, that's been doing a lot of different things around certain programs and policies. So why we went there with the group of Canadians was to figure out, you know, what are they doing around programs that we might be able to adopt in Canada? So that, that's the rationale. That's why we went. Um, I will say I am not an expert on, on Israel. Um, technically, I wouldn't even say I'm an expert on innovation. I don't think anyone could ever be an expert on innovation. Um, but a lot of our focus as a team is it's internal to Canada. How do we make Canada better? So I am going to show you a bunch of slides and some good data points that compare Canada in the provinces in Canada to the OECD countries as well as Israel so we can just get a relative benchmark of how we compare. I thought that might help set the context, kind of where are we today, um, and then we can talk about some of the programs that, uh, that we saw in Israel, and I can talk about programs we've seen in other places in the world, uh, but what can we do in Canada? What can we learn from that experience and, and possibly apply in Canada and maybe even Atlantic Canada? Am I projecting okay for the group? All right. Make sure this is going to click for me. So 
we always start with our def definition of innovation at the conference board. Um, we're a think tank, so we like a lot of words, typically. Um, all, for us, all innovation means it's something novel. But the second thing, it has to provide value. So if you get new knowledge creation, until it provides value, we don't treat it as an innovation. It can be a service improvement. It can be a product. It can be a social program, social innovation. It can be a process. If it's something novel or applied in a novel way and it adds value, for us, it's innovation. Processing services, products, process, even management structures and business models. So I always like to show this slide. I'm going to kind of, I'll give you the kind of the punch, uh, uh, kind of the, the punchier piece and I'll maybe help justify. So if we look at the innovation value chain as a series of discrete steps, the challenge we have in Canada is we're very good at knowledge creation. We're very good at the discovery side. We got amazing researchers, amazing post-secondary institutions. When we compare ourselves internationally, Canada does very well. We've got fantastic researchers and faculty members. The challenge we have is taking those ideas, that discovery research, and extending it to developing them further, trying to apply them to real business challenges, and then extending that. So it's essentially it's it's the commercialization and scale-up problem. We produce great ideas, but we're not as effective at moving those forward growing companies to scale that can compete internationally. So it, it's the challenge in Canada. When we benchmark performance on these domains, you know, we're kind of a B performer. And as we go down the value chain, our performance starts to slip. And we have a bunch of indicators that we use to, uh, to measure that relative performance. So, I, you know, it's, it's not a knock on post-secondary. It's not a knock on industry. It's not a knock on academia. It's not a knock on government. It's just this is the situation in Canada. We've done certain things with our innovation programming and R&D programming, and it hasn't borne the fruit that we see in other places. So how do we revisit that mix of program and policy and funding for innovation? So kind of what I'll, I'll provide is, is a very brief context of Israel. Uh, I'm not a, an expert in Israel, but I can at least give you the context about what they've done over three or four decades. I'll talk about the performance. I'll show you some data points that at least give you a sense about how they compare. And then we'll talk about uh, some of the things that might explain Israel's performance, but then really get into how it applies in Canada. So first, um, if you look at sort of the, I won't go through the, the history lesson um, of, of what has happened in Israel, but I will just say that they, they sort of over a series of decades moved from an agricultural economy. You know, natural resources are very scarce. They're not, they don't have, they have some natural gas, uh, but typically, you know, a very agricultural economy, not an innovative economy, but in a short period of time, They've gotten to a place where you know, people refer to Israel as a startup nation. There's been lots written about that. You may have read the book. They were able to sort of, series of investments, move themselves along the innovation value chain and providing value. And now they're embedded in global supply chains. I'll, I'll mention later part of that, whether it's right or wrong, part of it obviously comes from what they've done with defense spending. So they have invested heavily in defense from in in defense spending that has translated out into the broader economy and they've been able to market and commercialize some of those things. Um, so that is a key part of what they've done over the decades and they've been able to try to drive value from those investments. Frankly, the US did much the same thing. If you look at the US and, and their dominance in the aerospace industry and with large contractors, defense spending has been an important aspect of the US economy as well. Um, so it really drove, because of what they spent, that drove a lot of R&D investment. It drove a lot of sort of high skilled, um, a lot of research and development expertise because of that. So, you know, we look at now, they, I mentioned they have kind of very well um, um, educated, the educational institutions are, are really good. Um, we visited a number of the educational institutions in Israel, um, you know, Tel Aviv as well as Jerusalem, um, and Rhode Island and Beersheba as well. So we did visit a number of the institutions there and they have good researchers, but it's particular what they do in particular, sorry, is how they engage with industry. Okay. To match up the research expertise, get it out in industry, get it into the hands of a firm, start up a company, and there's a lot of government supports to fund that research coming out of the universities. So a couple of key points, they're world leader in venture capital investment. Um, they're second only to Korea in business R&D. I'll show a slide in, in a moment. Business R&D is the bane of my existence for Canada. We're terrible at it, but it's one of the key things they do very well that I think we need to learn. Um, and, uh, pardon me? Not South yeah. <laughs> Very good point, actually. <laughs> I'll make a point that that will be updated. Thank you, thank you. 
Um, and they're also among top countries for startups and rapid growth firms. But they've had a series of programs that help encourage that to happen. So it, I guess the point here is the very agricultural economy over a series of decades, they've done certain things to end up where they are today. Um, it's hard to draw a close parallel to Atlantic Canada, but typically, you know, uh, we've been a, a very, um, you know, low manufacturing type. Fishery has been important. Natural resources are very important to us, and we are blessed with natural resources. But more and more, we're trying to transition to the knowledge-based economy and some relative strengths we have here. So you look at what they've been over, over, able to do over three or four decades. It's impressive to be able to move along the innovation value chain like that. So we, we're talking now about government programming and policies. What we do today will take years and years and years to see the benefit from. It, it, that's the innovation cycle. The R&D cycle is a long cycle to get to value, especially if you're looking at emerging new technologies and, and products and services. It takes a long time. So just a quick comparison. Um, we, every couple of years, we do the innovation report card. We compare Canada, the provinces, and the developed nations around the world. We have a whole bunch of indicators that we use to create a composite score. So it's basically just how does Canada compare across a whole number of indicators in capacity, activity, and results. We get a composite score that places Canada. It holds consistent. Where we rank Canada is held. The World Economic Forum has consistent rankings that sort of match up with what we do. Um, so the data I'm going to show you, we did um, a little less than two years ago. Uh, my team is doing it again right now, so it should be published again by January. So we'll have a new report card with new data. But it's still fairly accurate. A couple things have changed a little bit, but it'll still give you a picture. I wanted to present just some of that information so you know, relatively speaking, where we stand. OECD, the developed nations of the world, the 16 OECD countries, and we've also plotted the provinces uh, within Canada as well to give you the relative rankings. So Newfoundland is 22nd. We were, importantly, we were ahead of PEI in New Brunswick, so we're better uh, in Atlantic Canada at least. Um, Scale matters. So Quebec, Ontario, um, BC, the larger provinces tend to do better. They're more diversified naturally. So there is, uh, you know, there is some level of nuance required when you interpret this. Developed economies, more diversified economies, uh, you're going to see different results, of course. So scale does matter, yes, but it does give you a sense, at least, of, of where we rank Canada compared to the countries. Yes? It was one of our indicators. Uh, one of the challenges of the productivity is measurement. It's measured you know, um, based on GDP. So our productivity a couple of years ago looked fantastic because the price of oil and gas per unit of labor. We had our productivity look great. So did Alberta's. But it's inflated because of measure of GDP. The one thing we find, we looked at the US. Um, the miracle of, the, of productivity in the US kind of happened in the 90s. And it, there's been a lot written about it. We, Economists will call it multi-factor productivity. I'm not an economist, so I won't define it in too many terms. But it's basically how humans and technology, capital investment, interact. There's something that they've done with ICT investment and technology adoption and how people interact with it that makes them more productive. I also think in the U.S. scale matters. And Canada's massive, and we're spread across, you know, within, within 100 kilometers of the border is 90% of our population. We're, we're spread wide. Um, scale matters, I think, for productivity, too. So we think there's something you know, in the US that they've done with how they've adopted technology and implemented. We see that every Canadian makes about $7,000 less compared to an American because of the productivity gap. That, that's, you know, that hits our pocketbooks as a, as a nation, $7,000 less per, per capita. Yeah. $7,000, yeah. Yeah, we have a, a whole host of different indicators that we use. Uh, when we just look at countries, there's 21 indicators, all imperfect measures. We, we completely acknowledge it's the best we can do on available data. Yeah, please. I don't see any social indicators such as uh, childbirth, death, uh, age, uh, yep. well-being, those kinds of things. Yep. No, are any of them captured? In the we have, a, we have a series of report cards, and it's all free consumption, by the way. It's called How Canada Performs. So on our, we have a health report card, and we recently did a socioeconomic report card. There's an environment. There's an education. So those are captured under a different report card. They're not included in innovation. Um, 
you know, you can make an argument for social innovation. We've looked at how do we incorporate it. It's hard to get good data that you can compare apples to apples across provinces and across countries. It's one of the challenges we have. Yeah, I mean, we do rely on StatsCan and OECD data points and a couple of other sources, but um, real good data is, is a tough point. Yeah, it's tough to get. Yeah. Yep. Yep, sounds good. Yep. yep, sure. So this is just the, the public R&D, government expenditures on R&D. So you'll see uh, Canada's in the red here compared to the other countries. Just want to give you a sense about how we support public R&D. We do have generous supports. Um, more, more is always better. Um, getting supports for the university and some infrastructure investments and the like. But this is R&D that happens in universities and in public institutes. So we do have good support in Canada. It is, there are effective supports. And you'll see the relative rankings here. Um, we tend to see Denmark, Sweden, Finland. These countries do tend to do well in our report card analysis year over year. And you'll see that's consistent with, you know, um, with other rankings you might see from other organizations. What I'd say you'll see in a moment, so for public R&D, we do, we do well. But that's sort of a, the front end. You, know, you invest a lot in public R&D with the hopes that you will get new knowledge spread to the economy, you'll grow companies, you'll grow business, and you can commercialize it and scale companies. As we kind of move down the value chain, you'll see that Canada sort of does well on the front end, but the point in the stick, sort of the, the, the commercialization end, we consistently do worse as we go down. So this is just a trend over time. You'll see uh, Canada's in the red here. Uh, you'll see kind of where our public education, um, higher education R&D spend has been. Just trying to give you some context. I can go through these fairly quickly. Scientific articles, so you saw what we spend in public R&D, um, and now you'll see sort of we're still in the middle of the pack. So for the R&D money that we spend, we do produce, we do produce fantastic scientific articles. We have very good researchers. Um, whether we need more or less of that is, is up for debate, but we sort of, we fall middle of the pack, and that's consistent with the fact that we also fund R&D in public institutes, kind of middle of the pack. Peer-reviewed, yeah, any peer-reviewed uh, uh, scientific article that's published, yeah, yeah. So when we look at PhDs, you start, you know, that's one of the challenges in Canada. We talk about the human capital and wanting and needing more PhDs, highly technical skills, you know, strong business acumen skills, et cetera. You'll see that Canada starts to slip as we go forward. We know, we, we always talk about the skills gap in Canada. And there are many of them and, and different ways of looking at them. And it's regionally specific, I would argue. Um, it, you would have Atlantic Canada that you don't have in Alberta or Ontario and the like. But it just gives you a sense about you know, the highly qualified workforce that we have relative to peer countries. Again, just context setting for you. Uh, researchers, so you know, I think this is an incredible stat. The next slide will, will show it more. You'll see Israel is a, is a research country. They've done a lot to invest in and support researchers. I mentioned about how they've used public procurement spend in things like defense and researchers in defense and the outputs of that. So you'll see where Canada falls on researchers, but the next slide is the one I really want to drive home to you. Here's researchers by sector. So blue is in business, researchers in business organizations, whereas yellow is higher education, green is government. So again, this. I'm, it's not a knock against the research we do in, in higher education, but it just shows that, you know, you look at Denmark, Sweden, Finland also comes out very good in their innovation report cards, and they're similar to Canada on business um, researchers, but it's just to give you a sense that where Canada lies and that a lot of our research tends to take place still in, in public and government institutes, at least in relation to Japan, uh, Israel, Austria, and a couple of others. So it's, that is one of the points that, Research capacity is not bad, but a lot of it is still in public institutes. Yeah. So I just went through a few capacity. I'll cover just a couple of these quickly, uh, the high points I want to share. Entrepreneurial ambition. So it's, it's a new category for us. It just gives you a sense, people reporting that they want to go into business for themselves. And we see a good uptick in Canada. There's a lot more interest in, in entrepreneurship and going into business for oneself especially with the, uh, the younger generations coming up through, we can see that there, there is something changing. Uh, people are more entrepreneurial. We do, capital makes a difference, frankly. Um, in this province, the oil boom has brought capital. 
there's a lot of interest in entrepreneurship and going, you know, becoming consultants, your own companies. Alberta, much the same with, with the oil boom. Uh, but it kind of holds true across all of Newfoundland, actually. When I, we didn't have enough sample size to permanently say that Newfoundland was better than the other Atlantic provinces, but at least the self-reported rates of entrepreneurial ambition were higher than the other Atlantic provinces, sizably so. But the, the sample size was too small to say, oh, we're confident. But, uh, but either way, it's a good, it bodes well for, for Canada that we're seeing this. The challenge is, historically, we've had high entrepreneurial ambition, people wanting to go into business, reporting that they're going to, but it didn't match up with business creation. So people were saying we're going to do it, but getting to the doing, it just it wasn't happening. IP was staying within the university or was staying in a the basement. They weren't actually creating a company to try to, to try to scale and grow. And by the way, it's not to say that it's a that any of this is good or bad. We've had great supports in Canada. You can make a great living in Canada. I think, we have, I think we're in the best country in the world, frankly. Um, so it's not to put a value judgment on where we should be. It's just giving you the stats so you know the relative context. Venture capital investment, I mentioned. Canada's improved a lot, actually, in the last few years. And there's been some federal programs to support that. And that's, that's been great. So venture capital, uh, you know, private money, is definitely not free money. Um, We've improved significantly. The only knock here, there's two conditions. A lot of it's coming from the US. So when you get venture capital, you want the money for investment. The second thing you want is the management expertise. So that's why you want VC. The problem is when it comes south of the border, there's a tendency to want to repatriate the management structure south of the border. Canada can become an R&D lab. So there are some challenges, but it's still good. There's, there's a lot of capital. BDC has done some impressive things as well uh, with their fund of funds programs. So. You know what? I could probably find it for you. I could definitely find it for you. I can follow up. Yep. yep. I would say a significant portion. Like I, I'll mention the bird program later. That's one of the big things they did. They made a decision to go out and get international venture capital investment into Israel. So the bird program is that the binational. It's a bipartisan. Uh, or, uh, so they call it the binational industrial research and development program. They go to a country like the U.S., which is where they spent a lot of time, to get direct investment into Israel. So I would say there's a significant portion of VC. I mean, you look, uh, BlackBerry has labs over there, EMC, IBM, you know, name the, the big high-tech company. They all have R&D labs um, over there, and they're springing up. So they, it is a direct investment to try to attract, yeah. So this is, this, I mean, it looks impressive what Israel has done as a, as a small nation, but I, I do like to show this. Next slide. There's California. So there's a reason that Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley. It's, um, you know, and it's a good question because I would argue that, you know, there is a lot of Silicon Valley money going into, into Israel as well. Yeah. But frankly, so there's a lot of U.S. money coming into Canada. So I'll try to find out if I can, uh, if I can get the stats on how much VC, if it's reported or not. I'd like to know. And there you get, so when we did the report card matching up data sets, that's a, another good point because you want to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. And even with OEC data, which is great, the OEC data points are great. We found so many discrepancies and with StatsCan and our research staff went back and said, look, we found X, Y, and Z. They weren't even aware. So we've actually, I think, helped to improve some of their, um, some of the ways they report data as well. They're doing it. Yes. For venture capital, uh, we I think we if I don't show it here, I do have a slide that I can that I can give you. We did plot it. Uh, so on this report card, it was just after Verifin got sixty million dollars. So when we looked at it, we did a three-year rolling average. When we had the provinces, you got to do a three-year rolling average, try to smooth out the blips. Even with a three-year rolling average, sixty million dollars into Newfoundland made Newfoundland go, you know, look very good. It's tough when you get an investment deal that, that size. Um, Ontario and Quebec and, and BC, because of Silicon Valley proximity, I, I, would, I, don't know, I would argue even more so now with, there's you know, a lot, it's only anecdotal at this point, but I have a lot of uh, people we work with and work we do with innovation uh, accelerators and things in BC saying, we're seeing a big influx of, of immigrant, immigrant entrepreneurs who want to come to Canada, want to repatriate to Canada. We all hear those stories. It's not evidence until you, you look at it objectively, so it's only anecdotal, but yeah. 
uh, Nova Scotia showed that when Canada as a region actually attracts mortgage capital and then our percentage of population goes to the US. Yeah, that's, so that's one thing. We show the absolute amount of venture capital. That's one thing we haven't done is done it as a, as a percentage of GD, as a, as a per capita, sorry, basis. That'd be fascinating. We're doing the, the study now, so yeah, I'll ask the team to, to include it because it's a good indication at least of, um, of impact, right? $60 million into an economy population base. You know, that rounds to zero in Toronto, for example, with you know, what is in the GTA now, seven or eight million people probably. So this was the one that drives me cracked, and I say this in presentations all the time. Business R&D, we're abysmal in Canada. And on our report card, if I included the provinces, the only jurisdictions that do worse than Canada on business R&D are the provinces in Canada. I love to say that for effect. It, we don't invest in business R&D. The last, rep I haven't seen, Research Money does a good thing where they um, look at business R&D and 12 companies accounted for 50% of the business R&D in Canada. 12 companies. That's the exact opposite of a diversified portfolio. Two of those companies were Blackberry and Bombardier, which are both going through difficult times. I think both are going to be okay, but um, it just we, we don't invest heavily in business R&D. We, we our companies do not invest in business R&D like other jurisdictions. Why that is, it, we think is a mix of, of reasons, but it's one of the biggest indicators of an innovation economy. 1% um, of an increase, every 0.1% increase in business R&D is a 1.2% impact on, on GDP. So you can move the needle that much, the economic multiplier is huge. So that's one of the, the glaring challenges we have, and the government's looking at different programs. Frankly, the cluster, pro, the cluster uh, super cluster announcement is to try to pump prime the system for that. You know, you gotta have matching uh, private money, the feds will put some money in. They're trying to create more of a business-led R&D infrastructure, which is one of the recommendations I have later. Put firms at the center, should be business-led R&D, um, get R&D activity into business. Yeah. So this just shows you the bird activity um, and how Canada continues to slide. Uh, interestingly, we sort of, around 2008, we really could have invested heavily, our companies could have, because we were able to attract capital at a discount because we had the strongest financial system in the world. Is that in terms of like machinery and equipment investment, we retrenched, even though we could have borrowed at, at, at fantastic rates and our system was strong and our banks were rated so well, we retrenched. Whereas other jurisdictions like the US, they sort of stumbled for a couple of quarters heavily because they knew the next cycle was coming. So there is something, whether it's cultural or the way our institutions are set up, we've got major protected industries in Canada which limit the amount of competition. I think all those factors are sort of causing us to not to invest heavily in business R&D. We, maybe we, the big sectors don't need to. You know, if you take those big protected sectors away, what is the, uh, there's actually been some evidence that if you took away like telecommunications, transportation, uh, all the protected industries, our productivity among our SMEs is actually pretty good. So it, competition, maybe that's the, the impact here. We don't have the scale in Canada, in the US, even with protected industries, they still have scale. So, what, what explains Israel relative to Canada? You see the business R&D side, the startups, number of startups, they lead the world. They're second for, for business R&D, um, venture capital investment. They're the number one um, country for venture capital investment, smaller than California, if you break out California. But what sort of explains it? And it, a lot of it, to be frank, it is they have invested a lot in the military spending. And they've used that military spending, you know, the, the boys have to go do mandatory three years in the military in Israel. Girls do two years. There are, there are a couple of groups that are excluded from that. Um, but they do have to do mandatory service. They get basically access to the technologies within the, uh, the military, some of the best thinking, training. Uh, they do simulations. So there's a, big, there's a big push to identify the real high performers early. And they're identified at 17 and 18 and 19. And then they're streamed for certain types of, they, they pick what education streams, but they get access to a whole bunch of technologies. And that has really developed this, this R&D mindset. They question everything. They'll question the technology. We can do that better. They're relentless at questioning, at picking things apart. So it, they have driven investments from, in defense. They've driven those out. They would develop a technology set from, from 
in defense and they quickly get it out to a business to develop it and scale it and commercialize it and they buy it from the business. So they want to get it in the hands of business, not hold it within the public institute. So they have driven a lot of innovation activity um, that way. And I know, I know that is, you know, that's a tough comment to make. I understand that. The U.S. has done similar things over the decades. Um, but it's just it's the reality of what Israel has done. Um, they have leveraged a lot of that military spending. Um, as a percentage of GDP, you'll see where Israel falls. So, you know, you hear the talk in Canada, they're trying to get us to 2% as part of NATO. Um, you know, we have a lot of spending to go to get 2%. This just shows you the relative rankings compared to the other countries. Please. In the United States, so the incentive to spend in military is very minimal. Here. Right? Yep. 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 And you at the U.S. As is the opportunity. We don't have an open-air lab that we can send our military into every three or four years, test out new weapons on live people. Or gas it, right? Yeah. Big difference. We should do this. Send the army Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's very complicated. I mean, and I, so I've, I, I've been to Israel once, you know. Uh, I know nothing. Tech, honestly, I mean, we looked at the innovation sector, and it's, it's a, so complex over there. I don't think, unless you've been to the Middle East, been to Israel, lived in Israel, lived in the Middle East, like, I don't think any of us can truly appreciate the context. I, I mean, I know I can't. I mean, Yeah, it is the innovation system. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you look at some of the indicators, this will demonstrate, you know, from 67 to 80, 260% growth in the number of scientists and engineers employed in industry. That's the highest growth in the world. Um, but this was the point I made about they get it into the hands of business. They want to get the technologies out the door into a company that can sell it. Um, and it really, they reshape the labor force. Their, their labor force of R&D people technological development, startups, that is, and they question everything. So that is what they've done. That's how they've created the startup environment they've created. They have used. Um, I, again, I just show you this to show the researchers again. We showed this slide earlier just to give you an indication. So, you know, um, I mentioned about the private sector. Um, talking about just the youth that actually go out and serve in the military and come out of the military. One of the, uh, kind of one of the, the challenges we see when we look at Israel, and, and there are a bunch of challenges, there's a heavy reliance on multinational corporations. So they partner in a big way with the U.S. and with other countries, the, the kind of the binational program they have, the BIRD program. They need multinationals to come in and invest in Israel to partner with them. So they don't have a lot of multi, big multinationals themselves. They are very much an, almost like an R&D center. That's, that's what Israel is with startups. Technology gets developed to a point that it can get acquired. They get foreign investment, et cetera. Heavy reliance on multinational corporations. We have that challenge in Canada too, frankly, especially in Atlantic Canada. Persistent management marketing weaknesses. They don't have a lot of people there who have actually scaled the business. So challenge, Atlantic Canada has the same struggle here. We tend, you know, in certain regions there's this branch plant situation where a company grows so big, gets acquired, the management team is repatriated somewhere south of the border, and you end up having a, a group of like almost an R&D lab in Canada. That happens quite often, unfortunately. We don't have a lot of, um, we, don't have, we kind of have a persistent weakness in that area. Difficulty growing businesses to scale. Uh, again, they don't have a domestic market. I mean, they're a small country. They don't have much of a domestic market, so they need to partner with other countries. I asked, um, we looked at one of the best relationships they have with the EU is actually with Germany. Um, and part of that is, is historical, just because a lot of people came. A lot of very intelligent people had ties back. So there's been a lot of work that's been done in partnership between the two countries. Um, they have a major relationship with the U.S., as you, as you might expect. So they've, they've been able to grow businesses to scale by attracting foreign investment, and they often get acquired, the technology sets do. They do have low productivity, um, again, and unequal distribution of benefits in the country as well. So uh, the income gap. Um, underrepresentation under representation of populations that actually benefit from the innovation economy, all those challenges. You know, it's not a panacea there. It, it's not, but they've done certain programming that we can apply in Canada. And that's kind of what I wanted to focus on is what can we learn about, what can we learn in Canada? So for us, one of the key findings is what's our innovation motivation in Canada? 
what drives us to want to innovate? You know, I, I know tons of people who graduated and they went to Alberta fresh out of school. Um, a couple of them, you know, a bunch of guys went to high school with, for example, who, who I don't even know if they got their high school diploma until three or four years after they, I graduated high school, for example. They got a job in Alberta, making tons of money. What incentive is there for people coming out of engineering, out of business, out of skilled trades, out of STEM uh, jobs, if you're going to walk out into a real good job, making a lot of money, you can buy a truck, buy a house. Like it, those things do, you know, for innovation to happen, it, you do need certain situations and, and certain things that push people to want to become an entrepreneur. It is a difficult life. So what is our motivation in Canada? And I think there's two or three things in Canada that, that we see early indications of it, but it's only anecdotal. Health is going to be a major problem for us. And we've always been very good at health research in Canada. Um, you know, by 2025, 40, it's predicted that 40, 40, sorry, by 2035, 45% of our budget is going to be spent on health care. So almost half our budget is going to be spent on health care, expected to continue to grow. That's not sustainable. That, you know, we can continue to pay health care, but then you can't pay infrastructure. By the way, in Newfoundland, our number one expense is health care. The second is the interest on our debt. But usually it's education the second, but... You know, we, there is sort of that, that challenge in Canada is that the motivation, healthcare might be one, maybe climate change and energy could be another. So there are a couple things that could drive, but I think it's going to be regionally specific. I think in Atlantic Canada, there's going to be certain things that drive us to want to innovate and want to create an innovation ecosystem here. But there has to be a driver. It's something that we can all get around, you know, to, to drive our activity. It's not enough to say, we should all go innovate and start companies. Okay, we got to scrape by for five years. And there's a great quote that says, an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur is one that's stuck around long enough. And that is the truth. I mean, anyone who I've known, I, I got a couple of friends who've done very well. And I hear the comments, oh, you know, he's made a bunch of millions. He got it made. You know, he's lucked out. They don't know the, you know, the six or seven years they lived with his parents in their basement when he was a 35-year-old man. You don't see that side. You know, you see the success. So it's hard to motivate. But we think the healthcare challenge, um, the support from the feds around things like climate change, and I think more and more health, they may help drive some activity. The supercluster initiative, I have hope for it. In Atlantic Canada, I do expect, I do hope and expect that we'll get an ocean tech cluster. Um, and and I, from indications there, there's been some great cooperation. That, uh, sort of on the hill in Ottawa, the notion is, man, whatever you guys are doing in Atlantic Canada to cooperate around ocean tech, it's amazing. I wish we could do more of that around the country. Yet, those of us within Atlantic Canada probably think we don't cooperate that well at all. So, either we're marketing ourselves very well, or there is some real cooperation. And, uh, you know, one of us uh, from Atlantic Canada would say, well, in Atlantic Canada, we'll always cooperate if there's federal money available. So, you could argue that, you know, taking advantage of an opportunity that's given to us. So, please. Yep. There has actually been some very unique, almost inspiring cooperation that uh, I would say we haven't seen in the past, not because people were uncooperative before, but I think they really did kind of rally around this, and I'd have to actually give uh, a lot of credit to the oil and gas sector, as well as the province, who really got on board with the whole effort. But the oil and gas sector, I think, to some extent, you know, they are the defense industry, you know, to some extent, to a large extent, they're the defense industry, the and Labrador, and to some extent, the line of Canada. And I think that what we're seeing now in that supercluster drive is to look at challenges facing the oil and gas industry in terms of operational efficiencies and bottom line, um, you know, to ensure that that industry can continue to operate in a competitive manner, digitalization, things like that, at the offshore, their new plan. And the question is, is to what extent enhancements, R&D enhancements on that front uh, can then be applied to other ocean related verticals throughout the land region. And that's where we've seen a lot of the other players starting to get involved as well. So it's been pretty inspiring, I have to say. I think most people are hopefully optimistic about the outcome. Yeah, just oh, yeah, on that. Well, I would say, regardless of the outcome, but Let, let's, uh, well, I think we're near it's close to finishing the presentation. Let's finish it, then, then we'll, we'll get into the discussion. And I should say, we should pass the microphone around as well so that people on can hear. Yeah, I only got about a minute left and, we're, and we'll be done here. Um, design programs and policy with firms at the center, that's, that's business-led. So the Supercluster Initiative is a good example. Not a knock on universities or, or academia or post-secondary, but 
making sure that we funnel money to initiatives that are business-led, firms at the center, understanding how you do that. So maybe it's funding incubators, accelerators. That's something that Israel has done. Other regions around the world have done very well. Um, frankly, Norway with its oceans, uh, I forget the name, the Oceans Center for Oceans, if you have a name on it, but I, I forget. They've done the same thing where there's a, basically a private sector consortia that has driven a lot of their activity to try to become a center of excellence in oceans. So that thinking that the private sector, they're, they're nimble, set up an environment that protects the environment, yes, that ensures regulation, but put firms at the center. Get money and, and the investment and programs that support it, because they're the, they're the doers. They're the ones that are going to make the global connections, et cetera. Uh, so I won't go too much into this. I've sort of I've, um, covered this. I would just say that letting private firms, whether you support them directly or through an incubator accelerator network that you might have uh, through certain funding and, and voucher systems, support firms and support firms that, that are further along in the value chain of innovation that are commercializing, trying to scale and grow. Uh, identify niche areas in supply chains, which is an important one, I think. So you can't, you can't do everything. We can't be an expert in everything. In Atlantic Canada, there's some great GIS, great ICT. There's some great mining innovation. But people look at Atlantic Canada and they think ocean tech more and more. So OK, let's strategically put more investment in a sector like that. You do still keep investment for other sectors, but think about niche areas where you can have a real advantage and support those niche areas. It's not picking winners per se, but it kind of is. Maybe, you're, maybe we're splitting hairs. Uh, but we do have some natural competitive strengths. So this was kind of direct and indirect funding for innovation. You know, so you see directed funding. Uh, that's Israel with the blue. Canada's yellow. Um, Canada is right here. Blue is our direct funding to business. Yellow is our indirect funding to government institutes. So again, we use an indirect means. When we did a, a regression analysis on all the OECD countries, basically on this, actually you've got business R&D and you've got indirect funding. All we're saying here is for those countries that do more indirect funding into public institutes, into government institutes, you get less business R&D. It's just a fancy way of showing the evidence that the more you do indirect funding, the less business R&D. It seems obvious, but we've been doing a lot of that in Canada because we're so good at discovery. We were, we were hopeful that it would, uh, it would get out of the system. You know, you, you pump prime the system, you do great R&D, you'll get good technology coming out. Pardon me? I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. And the probability is probably fairly high. It's probably marginal. Again, I can find it out. Unless I'm wrong on my guess, but my guess. So address gaps in management and marketing capacity. We talked about the skills gap we have here and how we need to encourage. Um, and I think, frankly, you know, attracting, uh, attracting intelligent, um, you know, with good connection, people, immigrants, those who have great home connections. That's all important. You know, I, we've done some research with a, not my group, but another. Immigrant entrepreneurs are incredible because they have so many connections to different places. They think differently than, so it, it's just important to have more and more of that kind of thinking to address the uh, capacity gap. So I just, I include this in my presentations when I'm across uh, Canada, just because it's a nice picture and I'm trying to get more tourism dollars just to, to come here. Um, but I always say this is sort of the looming challenge in Canada. We have a lagging innovation performance. We've got increasing healthcare costs. Our labor force participation rates are I have enough people for the jobs we're going to need. You hear all these mismatch of skills. But there's kind of the looming challenge is that iceberg. You see it. It's massive. You know what's coming. You can't stop it. You can't, you know, you, you got to prepare for it. And we need to do more around directed investment for innovation, I think.